Well, good evening. Welcome to the broadcast. It is March the 30th of 2022, and I'm glad to have you a part of our uh, Bible program here tonight at Beacon Baptist Church. And boy, I hope your week has been going well. And if you're like us here in Raleigh right now, the weather is everywhere. And uh, I was <laughs> seeing even today, it was freezing cold this morning and warm this afternoon. And uh, so whatever weather you're experiencing, wherever you're at, I hope you're having a blessed day and simply thankful to be able to enjoy the weather, to see the weather, to hear the weather, uh, to feel the weather. And uh, there's some who didn't get to wake up this morning and have that privilege. So uh, just another way to count your blessings here tonight. Again, I do hope your week has been going well. It's been going well for us here and excited to be back with you. And hope you enjoyed our throwback uh, from last week, uh, Brother C.T. Uh, Townsend, a uh, good friend of our ministry here. Uh, so thankful for that privilege to have him speak at our Southwide uh, Bible Conference uh, just this past year. What a great joy it was to have him. We hope you were blessed and encouraged by it. And as always throughout any of our broadcasts, you can reach out to us via comment uh, below. The easiest way really is you can just get in contact uh, right with me at Eric Faust, E-R-I-C-F-O-U-S-T at beaconbaptist.org. And uh, you can reach out uh, to me anytime and would love to hear from you. If you're here in the Raleigh area uh, and if you're a, uh, a church member here or a church goer, a uh, church guest, whomever, or a visitor looking for a church, I want to encourage you uh, to stop by and see us uh, this coming Easter. It's just a few weeks away on April the 17th. Uh, you may see a couple things floating around our city here. Uh, the first will be uh, these door hangers and uh, our church will be passing those out and just to simply inviting our neighbors and our friends to church. We have now one of these uh, QR codes and uh, you can just scan your phone, uh, just open up. You're not sure, Eric, how's that work? Uh, you just take a picture uh, or the picture app there on your phone. You open it up and uh, it, you just cover it right over that and it'll take you right to our website. You can find out more information or you can get in contact with me directly or one of our other pastors. Uh, also, uh, you'll be seeing these all around town. Another little invite card, and again, love to invite you. Uh, or if you're here local, stop by, pick some up. If you have some neighbors and friends, uh, family you'd like to invite to our service. One other thing I have here to my right is uh, yard signs. And again, we drive by these all the time. And I just walk by, we have about six of these left here at the church. And uh, so if you're interested in a yard sign, stop by tonight. I got a good feeling after service, uh, they will be gone. You know, statistics tell us um, that Easter is one of the greatest opportunities uh, to help reach folks that don't attend church regularly. And so I want to encourage you, whether you're part of Beacon or any other church, let's use this time of year as a great opportunity to reach people. And it is interesting, uh, the highest statistical um, church attenders, if you would, are those who come to church who are invited by others. Now, all this material is great and it's helpful, but what it really comes down to is you and I engaging with people. And I want to encourage you, uh, whether you're part of Beacon or any other church, I want to encourage you to engage with somebody else. Pray that God will lead you to somebody you can invite uh, to Easter. Why? To hear the message of salvation, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, just so excited to be a part of those things. And uh, my family and I also have an exciting uh, announcement we'll share uh, um, about some exciting things in the coming weeks. Ezra uh, chapter 9 is where we're going to be uh, here um, in just a few moments. And uh, we did begin uh, just a few weeks ago a short uh, a study on um, revival praying uh, from our good friend, Evangelist Scott Pauley. And I want to encourage you if, you, if you get a chance, pick up his book. It's an incredible, incredible read, uh, helping God's people getting back to revival praying. And so here we have taken this book and we have broken it uh, into uh, different lessons. And uh, there's also a, 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 a companion guide you can order as well uh, from this ministry. And it's just a wonderful help. We've been using it here in our adult Bible uh, study classes. And I uh, would encourage you, if you'd like to get one of those, you can follow along with us and you'll find all the answers uh, throughout the lessons as well. I have tied them in uh, to the preparation. So anyway, here, Ezra chapter 9, will arrive there in just a moment. You're not sure where that's at. Open your Bible to the book of Psalms and begin to go backwards. And uh, in just a few books, it goes Job, 
Nehemiah, Ezra. And uh, so you'll be able to find that uh, while we're looking. Or if you have your app, you can go ahead and just type that in uh, to the Bible app and you will find it. You ever hear the story of Larry? Well, the story goes, Larry goes to one of those faith healing revivals when it comes to town and he sits there in the pew and he listens to the speaker. Well, after a while, the preacher, the preacher asks anyone with needs to be prayed uh, over to come forward uh, to the front of the altar. So Larry um, is very interested in this, and so he gets in line, and when it's his turn, the preacher asks him, Larry, what do you want me to pray about for you? Well, Larry replies, preacher, I need to have a prayer for my hearing. So the preacher puts one finger in Larry's ear and he places the other hand on top of Larry's head and prays and prays and prays and prays. Well, after a few minutes, the preacher removes his hand, stands back and asks Larry, Larry, how's your hearing now? Well, Larry says, I, I don't know, Reverend. The hearing is not until next Wednesday. And uh, yeah, so think, <laughs> think on that. <laughs> Sometimes it's wiser to ask more questions, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it, has, it has been truly quoted, a, a wonderful quote here. You can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. You know, as a culture that is fixated on self-help, self-healing, and problem resolution, we must remember that a God-sized problem can truly only be solved by a God-sized person, God himself. You know, as difficult as this may sound, you and I cannot solve every problem. You and I cannot solve every broken situation and or every bad decision that we've created or that has been created for us. The truth also comes to other people's problems. You and I cannot always solve them. We cannot always fix the broken pieces and we cannot always mend the bad decisions. Yet the Bible does teach us in Galatians chapter 6 to bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, as American believers, we love the practical side of that verse, do we not? You see, we love to tangibly bear and or fix the burden of another, which is a great blessing. But please realize that simply burying a physical burden without a spiritual cause will only lead us to become great social workers. By the way, I'm thankful for all so social workers and the work that they do. But realize when it comes to bearing others' burdens, it's not just simply carrying a physical burden for someone or taking care of a physical issue. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ met the physical need and the spiritual need of others by first and foremost praying for them. You see, Jesus did not just simply pray a prayer, but Jesus specifically prayed a certain way for certain people. You see, this kind of praying is what the Bible calls intercessory prayer or prayers of intercession. You see, intercession is the highest form of prayer. Why? Because it is the kind of praying in which our Lord Jesus Christ does. You see, our Savior Jesus is praying for each of us. And He desires us to join Him in the work of intercession. You can read all about it in John chapter 17. If you would, prayer is the greatest work because as we pray, God works. Not just in someone else, but in us, us as well. So if you would, tonight as you and I are listening to even to this lesson and studying the scripture, there is a prayer meeting going on around the throne of God. And we have the privilege of participating with and in this work of intercession. You may be watching tonight and you may say, you know what, I can't do, you know, what can I do or what kind of 
part can I play? Well, let me remind you, you and I cannot do everything. But there is something we can do, and we can pray. And tonight, as we continue our study through the book of Ezra, we're going to learn about how Ezra in prayed intercessory prayers. Join me, please, in chapter 9. We'll begin in verse number 1. We'll read down to verse number 7. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests... And the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations. Even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptianites, <laughs> and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters to themse for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands." Yea, the hand of the princes and the rulers hath been chief in their trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of at the words of the God of Israel, because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished into the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness, having rent my garment and my mantle, and I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed, and blush to lift up my face to thee. My God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto heaven. Since the days of our fathers have we been a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings, and our priests been delivered into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, and to this, into a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. Truly, Ezra chapter 9, you could, if you wanted to put a little heading above it, you could simply even write the words, Ezra is astonished. After seeing all that God does, all that God worked through, all the miracles that brought him to this place, Ezra is astonished at the behavior of, of God's people. They had gone through captivity. They had come back and the walls have been built. The temples have been built. They have seen the hand of God work all over again. And yet here they are going all the way back to the days of Moses, disobeying one of the commandments that God had given to them. Do not marry from the heathen nations. You can go back and read later on around Joshua 23 and 24 about how Joshua then continued the law of Moses with this principle, do not marry from the strange nations for the purpose that those strange nations could lead your heart into idol worship, therefore leading a person away from God. Joshua reminded the people, as Ezra does, that God is a jealous God and no one deserves God's place in your life except for God. But as you read the book of Ezra here, we do come to understand that Ezra was not just a mere laborer, a mere worker, a mere teacher, or simply a great leader. We, do, we truly come to understand further in this text that Ezra was a man of great prayer. See, he was a man who understood that both he and those around him needed God's presence in their life. You know, as soon as Ezra had made a thorough confession to God above, he began praying for those around him. Confession of sin should naturally lead to an intercessory prayer for others. You know, as we bear the needs of others, God continues to work not just in their life, but in our life also. I love the scripture in the book of Job 
I, I tell you, if you have a chance, go ahead and flip over just a few pages to Job 42. We're going to turn our Bibles here a little bit more uh, tonight than maybe usual. I, I typically like to quote things to you um, and for you to reference them. Uh, but I, I'd like for you to read this here. In Job 42, in verse number 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job, why? When he had prayed for his friends. What an amazing truth in the life of Job and in the life of Ezra when they began to not just pray for themselves, pray for their needs and their desires and their family, but to begin to pray for others. You see, tonight it's very easy to complain about others, is it not? It's very easy to point our fingers at the wrongdoing, the wrong behavior, and the wrong attitudes of others. But I challenge and ask you here tonight, when is the last time you prayed for those who despitefully use you? Those who speak evil against you? Those who may not be your favorite person? When is the last time you've prayed for them? Tonight, not just those who are against you, but what about those who are for you? When is the last time you have taken their name to the throne of God? When is the last time you have asked God to bless their life? It's very easy to ask God to bless ours. But when's the last time you asked God to bless your neighbor? When's the last time you asked God to do something in someone's life, maybe an unsaved friend or family member, that would bring them to Christ? You know, I am convinced tonight that if you and I would quit trying to debate with the lost world and would begin to pray that God would move, I think God would move. Tonight, we're not trying to win people to us. We want to win people to Jesus. Because it is ultimately Jesus that offers true life transformation you and i we don't offer transformation many times we simply offer confirmation we try to conform them and tonight we're not interested in that what we're interested in is accessing the very throne room of god to watch god do a great work in somebody else's life tonight let me ask you a question before we dive into just a few simple thoughts do you pray for others? Do you maybe have a prayer list that you write others' names on? When you get a prayer sheet, many churches hand them out on Wednesday, or they do it digitally. When's the last time you've prayed through it? When's the last time you cared enough to look beyond your own needs? Now, I'm not saying your needs aren't important, but I'm also saying this other people's needs are important too. And here tonight, what we really begin to see here in the life of Ezra, this simple prayer... And this simple act here teaches us a few things about praying intercessory prayers. Again, tonight we're talking about revival praying. How can God truly bring a spiritual awakening back to, first off, my life, second off, my home, thirdly, my church, my community, my state, and my country, and then the world? Number one, if you're in the habit of taking notes, jot this down, if you would, please. We see beginning in verse number 7, the purpose of intercessory prayer. You see, in verse number 7, the Bible says, Since the days of our fathers have we been a great trespass unto this day for our iniquities. And what we begin to see here is that sin is rampant in verse number 7, and bondage, destruction, and confusion are the result of that sin. And so one of the things that leads us to pray, number one, is because sin is rampant. Can I encourage you and I here tonight, when you look into your life and the life of someone else, when's the last time about a particular sin you have said, God, would you help this person? God, would you free this person from their addiction? God, would you free them from the enslavement of pornography? When's the last time you said, God, would you help them quit their drinking? By the way, social drinking and and all kind of drinking is, <laughs> we'll study that one of these days, all right? Because the Bible does give some okays for it, but in very specific areas, um, very specific. And God, um, but anyway, we don't need to go there here tonight, but we'll go there one of these days. Um, by the way, if you're always looking for things in the Bible to, to you know, try to find a way to make your conscience better um, and, and to make your sin okay before God, uh, can I just encourage you, your attitude's in the wrong spot. It's not, God, what can I get away with? 
It, it should always be, God, how can I live most like you? Um, I don't understand this, this, this notion of, God, just what can I get away with? Uh, you don't find that in the Bible. Well, correction, you find that in the Bible, but it usually belongs to uh, the wrong kind of people, uh, uh, like Judas, okay? Um, you know, anyway, I got to move on. So, yeah, what's the purpose of intercessory prayer? Um, uh, by the way, I, I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm just being honest with you. You know, one of the things that's happening here in American churches is we are, we are trying to water down everything the Scripture says. Now, here is my goal in life. I want to have the right Bible position with the right Bible disposition. Uh, there's a lot of people, uh, because of their disposition, you turn the truth off to others, okay? Uh, sometimes uh, we're too abrasive. Sometimes, well, they're not getting saved because of the preaching the truth. It may not be that. It's the fact that maybe our spirit's wrong. Um, of course, we don't like to hear that either, do we? You know, we always think it's someone else's fault. Uh, but when you start to pray, uh, you just realize, wow, you know, A, I'm not as big as I think I am. Two, I'm not as important as I think I am. And God is so much greater and grander than anything I can imagine in this entire world. And here tonight, the purpose, again, of intercessory prayer, as we see in our text, is because sin was rampant. Sin had began uh, in the Father's. And that sin was being repeated throughout multiple generations now. And now Ezra is, is going to God saying, God, this is the condition. This is what's going on. There is a problem. He uses the word iniquity and he uses the word trespass. One is a sin against God. One is a sin against fellow man. And what, and, uh, what these verses help us understand is that when there is a problem, we can take it to God on someone else's behalf. Again, that was the context of what was going on. There's other intercessory prayers in the Bible where there's not necessarily sin involved. Somebody's hurting and God wants us to take their name to him. Other times it's simply that we want God to bless someone else. Um, so this is just our particular instance. The purpose here was that there was sin and it was rampant and it was going on. And do remember, like I teach my children, sin is a big deal to God. Yes, sin is a big deal to mom and dad, but more importantly, it's a bigger deal to God because we answer to God for what we say and what we do. Number two, from our text, we learn not only that the purpose, uh, or we see the purpose of intercessory prayer, but number two, we see the people for whom we should intercede. It's very interesting there in verse number seven, Ezra highlights three groups of people that he is going to intercede for. Number one, you find it there when he says, for our iniquities have, what's that next word? We. So you may ask yourself tonight, well, what are some areas I can, uh, as a Christian, I can intercede for? Number one, that we represents a nation. When Ezra says we, he is referring to the nation of Israel. Now go with me, please, if you're in the habit of taking notes, uh, jot a little note there uh, of Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, if you flip over there with me, please. Uh, let's do a little Bible walking here. It's so interesting. In Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 1 to verse 3, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Why? Uh, Paul, why do you have such sorrow in your heart? What is going on? For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Verse 4, who are what? Israelites. You see, Ezra and the Apostle Paul understood that when we begin to pray for our nation, we begin to break for our nation. Notice what Go one chapter over to chapter 10 of Romans, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel that, it, that they might be saved. You say, what's Paul doing? He's he is praying intercessory, if you would, for the nation of Israel. He is praying that God would save his people. He's praying that God would break through their cloud of religion and see Jesus as the true Messiah. What an amazing blessing it could be for our country if you and I would pray for our nation. You know, it's very easy to turn on the news and to uh, simply criticize everything that's going on in every organization and, and all the evil and all the bad and all that junk. But let me just encourage you. 
a lot more gets done when we start praying and interceding for them than us simply complaining about them. Let me ask a question. When's the last time you prayed for the LGBTQ community? When's the last time you prayed for them? That they'd come to the knowledge of the truth. That Christ would save them. That they would realize how much God loves them. And that their lifestyle is not a biblical lifestyle because it doesn't support the family and all those things. My heart breaks for them. We should pray for them to come to Christ. We're not at war with them, right? We're at war with Satan. And those kind of evidences and those kind of things we see in our life are public dis displays of what sin does to a culture and what sin does to people. So question here, are you interceding for our nation here tonight? It's interesting also the Bible says there, Ezra, when he prayed, when he interceded, he interceded for his nation. But number two, he goes on to intercede. He says in verse number seven, the, uh, and let's see here, and our, and, and our, and, pff, sorry, and for our iniquities have we, comma, our kings. And so our kings to them would have been what you and I call our civil authorities. Now over in First Kings, or sorry, First Timothy, go over there if you would please, and let's let's read some scripture here. First Timothy chapter two. Let's begin in verse one. We'll read down to verse four. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for who? All men. For who? Kings. And for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, again, it's a lot easier to criticize politicians, is it not? I recently heard of a, of a senator um, and a pastor was there visiting uh, him in Washington, D.C. And they had a conversation that went something like this. The senator and the pastor, they prayed together. And then he said this, the pastor, when he was done, asked the senator, what can we do as a church for you? And the senator, as straight and as honest as could be, said, I need you to pray for me. He said, I am in a cesspool of evil. I need you to pray for me. And so here tonight, it's very easy to get critical of our political leaders, is it not? It's very easy to get swept up in all the movements and all the, uh, all the uh, um, uh, swirling, if, if you would, uh, uh, pools of quicksand that the news are constantly throwing our way. And before long, we think they're our, our enemy. But can I encourage you here tonight, before you criticize our president, have you prayed for him? Have you prayed God would change his heart? Do you know God is bigger than him? God is bigger than Putin. God is bigger than any leader in this entire world, and God can change the heart of a king. Why? Because he's done it. What if God saved him? How about our vice president? How about those in the House, those in the Senate? How about those that represent our states? How about our mayors and those that are around us? Do you pray for them? I want to encourage you, if you don't even know who they are, make a list. Pray for them. God commands us to, to intercede for them. Because wouldn't it be a wonderful work of Satan to get into their life because he understands how much influence they have over people and nations. But what if God's people got into their life and started seeking God and asking God to turn back the tide and asking God to awaken their heart to the reality that God is real, that salvation is true. And the only way of heaven and true peace and satisfaction in this life is the way of the cross. What if God's people got a hold of that? What if every church, instead of uh, going to using your social media accounts to blast everything, and I'm not saying don't stand up for truth, I'm not saying that, but it should always be balanced with the reality that I'm praying for them. I'm praying God will change their heart. I'm praying God will work in their lives. Ezra did. And here's a, here's, here's a third thing. You see, there in Ezra, he not only mentions the we, which is his nation, the kings, which would be his civil authorities like ours, but lastly, he goes on to mention there in verse number seven, who else is he interceding for? He says, in our priests. And those would be the religious leaders of the day. Go with me, please, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 13, and uh, we're winding down here. But Hebrews number 13, uh, again, in verse number 17, uh, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. Um, as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief or that is unprofitable for you. Pray for us. 
For we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. And again, the Apostle Paul is, or uh, the, the writer of Hebrews, wink, wink, uh, is, um, <laughs> is telling us, again, the importance of praying for those who uh, lead you closer to Christ and those who are supposed to represent the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I encourage you here tonight? Pray for your pastor. Instead of having him for supper before he ever comes over, pray for him. Pray for him. You know, it's a lot easier to criticize people who, don't, who, um, who you don't know the weights and the burdens they have to carry. And again, I, I've, I, I've seen both sides of this, and I encourage you to pray for your pastor. He's not perfect. He's going to make mistakes because he's human. And any pastor that puts himself on, on a throne that uh, makes himself higher than God is wrong. Amen? Amen. Tonight, I'm also a pastor. And we're not perfect. We fail. We don't always have the best ideas. We don't always have the best motives. We don't always have our heart and mind in tune right either. Sometimes our words are not always seasoned with salt and grace. Sometimes the decisions we make aren't full of growth, both grace and truth, like our Lord. And so here tonight, the encouraging thing is to pray for your pastor. Pray for him. Pray that God will give him wisdom, that God will give him love. Pray that God will give him patience, because there are sometimes God, uh, there's some people that like to test the patience, amen? And uh, let me just, uh, while I'm here, let me just encourage anyone who's watching here tonight. Um, God didn't call anybody to try and keep their pastor humble. Satan does a great job of that. I've heard many men throughout the years, well, God put me here to keep my pastor humble. Um, listen, don't, don't be that attitude. Don't be like that. Uh, that's not the way God designed it. Satan is a master of that. Uh, make sure you know whose side you're on when you're doing that, all right? I uh, just want to encourage you in that way. But pray for your religious leaders. Ezra did. He said, God, that they could lead us the right way. They can teach the truth in truth to help us draw, clo draw closer to God. The true heart of a, of, a, of a pastor or a religious leader is not to draw you to them, but it's to draw you closer to him. Because we truly understand it's nothing, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Him. Number three, again from our text. The purpose of intercessory prayer in our text was because sin abounded. The people to whom we should intercede for is our nation, our individual people, right? Our civil authorities and our religious leaders. Well, let me give you one final thought um, here tonight when it comes to intercessory prayer. And there's so much more uh, that could be said, um, uh, but uh, that's all we have time for. Number three here, write, uh, jot this down if, again if you're taking notes. We find the partners that we have in intercession. Would you join me please back in the book of Romans. Romans chapter number. You can go ahead and leave off Ezra. And I just want to encourage you with this final thought here tonight in Romans uh, chapter number eight. Again, we're talking about the partners we have in intercession so we're not it's not just us praying for others notice please in hebrews chapter 8 in verse number 34 who is he that condemneth it is christ that died yea rather is risen again who is even at the right hand of god again if you're in the habit of marking things or highlighting in your bible highlight this next phrase who also maketh intercession for who for us wow Go, go uh, to, if you're in a habit, make a note right next to that verse and write Hebrews 7.25 down. And then go over to Hebrews 7.25 uh, and notice what the scripture teaches there. Beautifully, just, just, just beautiful. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the utmost. That come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to what? Make intercession for them. You see, tonight, our prayer partner, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You see, God is interceding, the Lord Jesus is interceding for you right now. You go and you can read throughout the scripture, sometimes he is simply interceding to God, and other times because Satan is trying to accuse you, he is standing in the middle saying, I represent him. Tonight I'm thankful Jesus is my representative. But more than me, he wants to be your representative. Tonight, he intercedes for you. 
Oh, all the, Eric, you don't know all the sin I've done. God does, and Jesus still intercedes for you. He died for you. He loves you. Ah, oh, what, a, what a blessing. I, I came across this quote. I thought it was very interesting. It says, I ought to study Christ as an intercessor. He prayed most for Peter, who was to be most tempted. I am on his breastplate, if you would, or near his heart. If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet, the, differ, or the distance makes no difference. Why? Because Christ is praying for me. Tonight, what if you were to walk into your house or if you're uh, in home watching this and you heard the Lord Jesus in the next room praying for you? There'd be nothing you'd be afraid of. There'd be no situation to be too big, problem be too hard. Financial setback, that would be too difficult because I know Jesus is praying for me. And if Jesus is praying for me, it's going to be all right. But can I encourage you here tonight? According to Scripture, He is. He is interceding for you. Oh, Now, speaking as a follower of Christ, we come to understand in the book of Romans also, that the prayer partner, not only in heaven, but we have a prayer partner in our heart, and that's the, um, that's the Holy Spirit of God. Notice with me chapter 8 of Romans, verse 26. You can just jot these verses down. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what, what we should pray, for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to his will. You see, here, here tonight, it's not that we always have to know how to pray to intercede for others. We don't always have to have all the right words. But if you're a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you. According to the Bible, the Holy Spirit of God can lead you. So I encourage you when you pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, teach me how to intercede for others. Teach me what to say. God, lead me. And God, as you lead me, God, would you lead others? You know, through in intercession, I really do believe we begin to know the heart of Christ for people. And we begin to gain heaven's perspective on the world all around us. You know, prayer is the greatest work because as we pray, God works, both in us and in those we're interceding for. You know, there is no limitation to the ministry of intercessory prayer. But tonight it all begins with praying. So my question as always is, are you praying? Do you have a time that you meet with the Father? So I hope this message has been encouragement. And if there's a way that I can pray for you, would you please reach out and let me know. You can reach me at Eric Faust at BeaconBaptist.org. I'm looking forward to our next lesson together. God bless you. Hope to see you sooner than later.